they were children going down to the woods that night and you know once the incident had occurred they had to grow up very quickly um, they lost their innocence uh, their confidence uh, their trust in other people that must be a dreadful thing to try to come to terms with No one was caught, leaving Pembrokeshire police with three unsolved violent crimes in 10 years. At the same time, the local area was plagued by burglaries and armed robberies. These robberies tend to, to fit into the same pattern. Single females in houses attacked during the evening by a single offender, and the offender was carrying a sawn off shotgun and had a balaclava. In November 1996, the intruder was disturbed during one such robbery. Fleeing the scene, he discarded items in a hedge. Police making inquiries at a nearby house found stolen goods. The house belonged to John William Cooper. We looked at in a region of 70 burglaries that we believed he had uh, he'd committed not only his house, but his family's houses were searched and uh, a great deal of property were recovered from those houses. The evidence found connected him to 29 burglaries and an armed robbery, where he used a sawn-off shotgun and wore a balaclava. That was the first time that John Cooper came on the radar for being a suspect of the murders at Scoverson Park and the Coastal Path. Cooper was questioned about the four killings. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a murderer. I am not a murderer. John Cooper would never admit his guilt. So it was felt that to connect him to the double murders, there would need to be a what we call the golden nugget of forensic evidence. At that time, forensic analysis drew a blank. They're using me to clear old crimes. It shouldn't be allowed. It shouldn't be allowed. Cooper was sentenced to 14 years for burglary and robbery. For eight years, all the evidence collected for the case was carefully stored by David Powis Police. In 2006, it was finally time to launch a cold case review of the three crimes. We were always confident that uh, John William Cooper was the prime suspect. Having said that, we were not tailoring our investigation towards an individual. It was a search for the truth. Advances in forensic science might now lead them to the golden nugget of evidence they needed. But it was a daunting task. We're probably talking in the end around about a million and a half to two million pieces of paper, which we have to physically go through. We are talking of, of thousands of exhibits. The team had to make vital decisions about what might give them that crucial forensic link. We knew that we couldn't just say, right, there's 5,000 exhibits. Here you are, forensically, look at those 5,000 exhibits, because A, it's not practical, and B, you just couldn't afford to do uh, an investigation. Week after week, then month after month, they selected items to send to the forensic lab. And scientists scoured them for potential DNA evidence. In the meantime, an interview team was put together. Over the following few months, they would learn more about John Cooper than he knew himself. Within a social environment, he could come across as a very pleasant individual. A number of people that actually played darts with him said that he was very well-mannered. Can you name one of them? Hampshire. Is right, sir, for 140 pounds. You could go into any high secure prison this afternoon and you would meet many, many charming men. Now, the surprise behind that warm social persona 
There is sometimes, you know, a man who has a less warm, colder, callous persona. Behind closed doors, Cooper took his aggression out on his son, Andrew. Emotionally, the worst time I'd been fishing down uh, the, at the pond, I came across the field and he was walking out, going um, shooting. As I got to him, he hit me with his open hand to the floor, put his foot on my chest. He put the barrel of the single gun, single barrel in my mouth. Told me how worthless I was. Told me that the family didn't want me anymore and he was going to end my life. And then he went quiet and I just stared at his finger. And he was slowly, it was like he knew I was watching his finger and he was slowly squeezing this trigger. And when his finger got halfway down, I just felt really calm. And I just closed my eyes. My body went completely calm. And I felt the click. He pulled the trigger. There was no cartridge in the gun, but I didn't know that. And that's the day my childhood ended. From that day on, it was 11 years old. John Cooper was a gambler. Building up a picture of his background, police found out he'd won £90,000 on Spot the Ball in 1979. We didn't benefit from that money. It was all him, it was his drinking money, his gambling money. But with the drinking came more beatings. When I was 12, I don't even remember what I'd done. He got hold of me on the landing, he'd shove me in my bedroom, he'd bounce me off the walls as usual, he'd throw me on my bed. And he started punching me, he, I mean, he used to strangle me. And he held me by my neck and punched me so hard in my back that I let out a scream, but it was as if someone else was letting it out. I've now got 12 screws holding my spine together. Cooper's prize money should have set the family up for life, but over the following years, he lost it all. He entered into a number of business ventures um, which were, were built on sand. They were doomed to fail. As he lost money then, obviously the lifestyle that he had then adopted began to suffer. That began to make sense in terms of better understanding burglaries, obviously, because he's after money, but also about risk-taking and excitement to compensate for whatever else was missing in his life. One of the things that I think is particularly uh, saddening about the murder of the Dixons is they were a couple happily walking on a coastal path on a bright summer's day. And I think perhaps this man had a very strong sense of envy that people could live a life like that apparently happily when he so blatantly could not. John Cooper craved respect. So the interview team were briefed to listen and let him feel in control. I thought that if we got him to talk, then he may provide us with some ammunition to come back and challenge him, him later on. In July 2008, while waiting for a forensic breakthrough, the team spent four days interviewing John Cooper. He was still serving time for burglary, but a release date was imminent. The first three days, we just allowed him to talk. Tell me about the times that you actually know I went to the Department. I've seen the pictures of the place and I've seen it in the papers and what have you. Uh, I've already answered the question. Outside then, then, about 12 days. Have you ever been to the 
He wasn't challenged, we just invited him to tell us about Cooper. One of the drill bits caught in, um, in the wedding ring and uh, it was well worn from working on the buildings and I nearly went over the side so most of the time my wedding ring wasn't worn by me, right. much, much to my wife's uh, right. uh, displeasure. The team hoped that by letting Cooper talk he would give something away. During yesterday's interview, John, yes, you mentioned that during the trial, you handled a shotgun. Oh, a shotgun was in the court, yes, I believe it was, yes. Uh, the shotgun used in the robbery that I was convicted of. In yeah, 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 yeah. They noticed Cooper kept referring to a particular shotgun that police had already identified as a potential murder weapon. Whether I handled them or not, I can't, I can't remember. He actually wrote down on a piece of paper uh, the, the Judge Morton Sardis gun destruction order. Quite clearly that gun was causing him problems, though he'd already served the sentence for it, so we couldn't really see why he was worried about that particular gun. Cooper believed the judge in his robbery trial had ordered the gun to be destroyed and seemed worried that it had been kept. It had already been forensically examined, but police asked scientists to inspect it again. John Cooper was returned to his cell to see out the last few months of his prison term. I think he came out to the interviews as if he had won the battle. He was confident that at um, the conclusion of the inquiries that he wouldn't be charged. In January 2009, John William Cooper was released from prison. I'd had a conversation with Adrian West and some of the things that he said to me really caused me concern in that, you know, Steve, the person who's done this has enjoyed what they've done. He will uh, be released into the community. He will have ideas about what he's gone to do. They will fail. He will enter a spiral of offending and he will uh, kill again. In January 2009, John William Cooper was released from prison after serving 10 years for burglary and armed robbery. I'm not a murderer. I'm not a murderer. I am not a murderer. David Powers police believed he'd committed four shotgun murders, a rape and a sexual assault, but had never been able to find proof. In 2006, they had launched a cold case review, determined to find a forensic link in items taken from Cooper's house. We were always told by our barrister that if we had that one piece of golden forensic evidence, then we'd make our case into a very, very strong, compelling case. Two years into the inquiry, after failing to find DNA evidence, the team changed tack and started to look at clothing fibres. It is amazing. There's a huge variety of different textile fibres, and I think people don't quite realise the enormous variety there is, and therefore why it's such a good evidence type. Analysts looked at tapings from various exhibits under a microscope to identify any matching fibres. One of the items police chose for examination was a pair of John Cooper's shorts. Those shorts very much fitted the profile of uh, a, a photo fit of an offender who was seen using the cash card belonging to Peter Dixon. They were three years into the inquiry.